Hello, everybody. I'm going to give you uh, uh, information on the iteration. I've already done this video once, and then I did it all and then discovered I didn't have any audio. So it'll be a little more condensed than it would have been otherwise. So up to now, we have talked about all these items here, input, output, arithmetic assignment statements, Boolean expressions, if statements. We've talked about pound sign include, using namespace standard, int main, return zero. We did strong typing by using int, double, and ca. We mentioned bool. We didn't use it, but I'll use it today. We also looked at blocks defined with the braces and the use of semicolons. And among the includes, we had iomanip. So, so that's where we are. That's what we've done. The next tool is iteration. In Python, you use the for and the while. We have the for and the while in C++. But our form of the for is different. Actually, we have two kinds of fours. There is a Python-like one, but I won't be able to do that till later because I really need to have vectors or arrays before I do it. Uh, and the while statement we can do in one in two different ways. I'll only do one right now. So as I usually do, I'm going to go by example. I'm first going to try to compute n factorial. Uh, n factorial may seem esoteric, but if you do anything with probability, and even in some games, you uh, often need the n factorial. It's very easy to compute. Zero factorial, if first it's only defined for non-zero, uh, <laughs> defined for non-negative integers. So zero factorial is one. X factorial is X times X minus one factorial. Whenever we have X greater than or equal to one. And I did five factorial out here in full detail. Five factorial is five times four factorial. Four factorial is four times three factorial. Three factorial, two factorial, one factorial, and finally I get the right answer. Well, let's see what the algorithm would be there. We're looking for loops. Always remember when you look at these algorithms, you're looking for loops. Read in. If n equals 1, if, if n is less than or equal to 1, print 1. That's 1 factorial and 0 factorial. Now, start off with 1 as your answer. For the values from 2 to n, multiply answer by y. That keeps uh, uh, moving us up. When we finish, print answer. A for loop has the following form. For type, whatever kind of type of variable you want, the variable name equals what value you're going to start with, what test to see if you uh, want to keep going or not keep going. Actually, the this is why when we want to keep going and then how to change the variable each time we go through the loop. So here's the, the uh, loop that I'm going to have in my program. I'm setting up a variable called count. I'm starting count at two. I'm testing to see if count is greater than n. Because if it's greater than n, I leave the loop. If it's less than or equal to n, I keep going. I do whatever is in the braces. I add 1 to count, because that's what this means, which I'll mention in a minute. And I repeat from line r. First, and, and this is where the, uh, the loop is done. When we, That's where we go. We go after the loop. First. The machine does the changing of count. Don't touch the variable count inside that for loop. 
whatever variable name you give here, don't touch it. Don't change it. The machine takes care of that. Second, the test is done before we enter the loop, which means that it's possible that we don't go into the loop. If the first value, excuse me, is greater than n, we wouldn't go in even once. This is a pretest loop. And finally, for integers, when we say x plus plus, that's equivalent to x equal x plus 1. There's also an x minus minus. And we'll find out there's a couple of other ways to do it, but these are what we need now. Now, I've already written the program, so I'm not going to start it from scratch. I'm going to bring up the program, and then we're going to take a look at the program. So here's n factorial. I, I copied the algorithm into here because that way I have it. I know it's there. And the algorithm starts in the usual place, putting in the namespace standard. And then I look at the algorithm and see uh, what variables do I need? I see an n and I see an ants. And they look like they're integer. So why don't I declare them? Into n and ants. Next, input a non-zero integer, read it. That is the way I, I like to get my values in. Uh, I like to tell the user what they're supposed to put in because they, I don't want them flying blind. And if you're having trouble which way these things go, think of it this way. These less than signs seem to point towards the C out. So we're taking whatever is on the right-hand side here and pushing it to the output, to the C out. In the C in, the arrows point the other way. So we're taking whatever's coming from the input and putting it into N. That's the way I remember them. It works out. I'm going to do something I didn't do in the algorithm. I'm going to check for bad input. If N is less than zero, it's the illegal input. Run again. Else, if n equals 1 or n equals 0, see how n factorial equals 1. Else, answer equals 1, and here's the for loop. Start at 2, and, by, uh, and keep going. Keep multiplying answer times count. Print out the answer, and now I'm finished and I can return 0. A warning. Uh, uh, this is a pretty common way to program. You get rid of the special cases. The cases that are uh, a little, uh, they gum up the works, if I, if I can use a non-technical term. Uh, I really don't want, uh, it's, I don't really need to do anything with one and zero. So I'll just put them there separately. And then I'll run them there. The program worked. So I'll let you try it. I'm going to copy that program into the uh, uh, handout I'm, uh, I'm posting, and you can copy it back into C++ and see that it works. So that's the first of it. What you need to know, what you need to remember, is what a for loop is like, how you define it, and this new concept of an increment by one or decrement by one. Here's the program. If you want to run the program, copy this with a controlled C and then copy it into a uh, CPP file and run it. Now next, I'm going to try another problem. I'm going to input an integer again and I want to know if it's prime or not. Now, prime, you may think, is a pretty crazy idea. A prime is a positive integer greater than or equal to 2. So it's only possible devices of 1 in itself. 
For example, 6 is a divisor of 36, but not a divisor of 37. And it's very easy to tell if something is a divisor. All we do is use the mod. 36 mod 6 equals 0. That means that 36 is a multiple of 6. There's nothing left over when we divide by 6. So 6 is a divisor of 36. If it doesn't come out 0 when we take the mod, it's not a divisor. Uh, primes are used today in cryptography. That is the encoding of messages. Uh, I think trillions of dollars cross the Atlantic every day. And they're protected by uh, codes that in many cases depend on very, very, very large prime numbers. That is the current uh, method that we use for encoding. It's called the public key cryptography or the RSA algorithm. So here's my algorithm. This is based on an algorithm from a, a Greek of the ancient times. In case you don't know, maybe maybe they told you this in, in Western Civ, I'm not sure. The Greeks were extremely good in math. They, uh, If you want to blame anybody for making math important, blame the Greeks. The Greeks had uh, many of the ideas that we've carried forward, including geometry, for example. Now, there was a Greek named Erastenes, Eratosthenes. I may have that spelt wrong, but I think it's close to right. And he came up with a way to enumerate all the primes. His concept was simple. He said, let's lay out all the numbers from two up. Now I'm going to go through, two's there. So I'll leave two, and then I'm going to go through all the rest of the numbers and cross out every multiple of two. So when I finish, after two, the next number left is three. Now I'm going to take that three and leave it there. That's a prime. And cross out all the numbers that are greater than three. Uh, that are multiples of three from there on up. So six goes, nine goes, etc. Now there's no four. I wipe that out with the twos. The next one is five. So now I'm going to wipe out all the five multiples. So 25 goes. And after five, six is not there. But seven is there. So I multiply them. I throw out the multiples of seven. And when I finish, whatever's left, those are primes. So that was a nice little trick. I should point out that the, the Greeks loved primes. Uh, sometimes I wonder that there was a Pythagorean society in uh, Greece that uh, sometimes almost considered a cult. And there's a possibly not true story that when the Pythagorean society found out that there was a proof that the square root of two was not a rational number, they took the man who proved it out on a boat trip and he never came back. But we're not, that's only a folk tale. So here's my algorithm. I'm going to first check and see if it's two or three. They're prime. Why do anything else? Then I'm going to have a variable called possible prime, I'm going to, uh, which I read in. I'm going to, if it's divisible by two, it's not a prime. Those are my special cases. Now I start off with the possible divisors. Because I got rid of three, I don't have to have any special trick with three here. Possible divisor three starts off. And I'm going to use a Boolean. I'm going to say, when I enter this loop, I don't know whether it's a prime or not. I'm not sure. So it's false. I don't know the answer. Now I'm going to come down and say, well, possible div is less than or equal to the square root of the possible prime. But this, it's important to think about this. I did this down here a little. This was my rationale for doing that. 
what I'm going to do. I started off with three as a prime. If it's a divide, I, I mean, I started off with three as a possible divisor. If it divides it, the possible prime's not a prime. Then I add it, then I went to five. If five divides it, it's not a prime. Then I went to seven. If seven divides it, it's not a prime. And I stopped at, uh, at the square root. For example, if I had 29, five times five is 25. Seven times seven is 49. One of the multiples, if I have A times B equal 29, one of them's got to be at least the square root. If both of them are above the square root, then when I multiply them together, the answer's above the square root. So I can stop at the square root. Many people get that wrong. They think it's two, one half. Nope, it's the square root. So what I did is I say, well, I'm less than or equal to the square root, and I don't know the answer. If I find out the answer, if I know it's prime, say known equals true, else keep going. When I get out of the loop, there were two ways out. Either I got known to be true, or I went above the prime, the number here. If I got known to be true, it wasn't a prime. If it wasn't true, it was a prime. This is the same kind of while loop you have in Python. I can have lots of different pieces of it. And just as in Python with the if, we have to have an outer parentheses that you didn't need in Python. And we use braces, not indentations. Although actually most people indent just to make it look pretty. They don't necessarily, uh, the, the machine does it for us in fact. But the indentation means nothing. It is the braces that cover everything. So now let's run this program. So I'll kill this. And I'll bring up this program. It is prime. I put the algorithm in again. And now, I'm starting out with possible prime. And as usual, I'm reading it from the user and asking the user, telling the user what I want. Here's my first case. If it's one of those, it's a prime. Here's my second case. If it's divisible by two, it's an even number. Now notice I already got rid of two. So I'm not worried about two here. I'm starting at uh, the, the smallest even number I would have at this point is four. If it were two, I would already have taken care of it. So it's not a prime. Else. All right. Why did I put the delay putting these uh, decorations here? I did that because I don't really need them until I get inside this loop. And I want to start talking a little about the concept of scope. These two variables are only known in the brace that begins here. They have no meaning. They don't exist out here. The scope of them is the smallest set of braces that uh, includes them. That means they don't have to be defined until they're needed. If I have one of these cases, I won't even need them. So that the trick is usually to put them where you are starting to use them. Also, I did something new here. When you define a variable, you can give it a value. You can give what value you want for it. That's an initialization. It sometimes makes it easier. And also, I decided that I didn't want to compute the square root of the possible prime all the time. So I did it once and for all under SQR. That's, a, that's an efficiency. It's not defined 
it, it's not being redone all the time. And a bool is my Boolean, and again, I initialize that. Now I have this for loop, the while loop, just as I said I would. I have this, I change known to true. I just found out it's not a prime. Else, start off, uh, else, move forward to the next possible uh, div the divisor. I start out with three, which is odd, and as I keep adding two, I get only odd numbers. Yes, I'm doing some inefficiencies here, but until we know how to do arrays or vectors, this is the way to do it. When I get out of the while loop, I ask, what's the value of known? If the value of known is true, then I found something that divided it. That's the only way I turned known to true. Otherwise, it's got to be prime. I in that else. I in the else branch that I'm working on above that. I return zero. And the program's done. Now let's run it. I'll test it with two. Two is a prime. I'll test it with three. Three is a prime. I'll test it with 25. 25 is not prime. I'll test it with 29. 29 is prime. It is, by the way. I'll test it with uh, 120. It's not a prime. So I suspect it works. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this file out there and it has the program on it. So if you want to run the program yourself, you can copy it. Just go here and go down, and map it out, go control C and then bring up whatever you're using as your C, uh, as your C compiler start a new file and copy this program into that program uh, into that particular project with a control v and then just run it uh, that's it for now i'm going to put out homework fairly shortly uh, and i'll put out this particular uh, video so long